Bring it out! When I was a guerrilla fighter living in the tunnels of Iraq, a lot like Dune 2, Arrakis, our biggest fear was an uh, invasion by a much larger force. So today I'm going to describe how we would have reacted. It comes in two stages, the initial invasion and the post-invasion. If you remember my last videos on tunnel warfare, if you've just been keeping up with the Israeli military's progress in Gaza, you'll know that I was sincere when I said tunnels are pretty much impossible to defeat. It, you cannot just take over even dense urban terrain or mountainsides that are full of tunnels. There's hundreds of kilometers of these things. There's bunkers and murder holes everywhere. There's IEDs. There's everything imaginable. Even with the immense amount of technology and hardware at the disposal of the attacking force, you're not going to be able to take over that land easily at all, if ever. So the idea of our tunnels, which is well known, is to prevent any safe landing of helicopters and troops into the mountains. We're going to give them a hell of a first day. Their first day on, on our mountains is going to be, for many of them, their last. A lot like Dune, we lived in the safety of the tunnels where, even if we were surrounded, we had years of food and water and everything you need to survive electricity gasoline we have thousands of exits from these tunnels each in a strategic location to give interlocking sectors of fire for machine guns some bunkers are made for mortars other machine guns but each was designed and carved out reinforced with steel and concrete to withstand any job that we might have to do from them luckily because we have the people on our side we have advanced knowledge on when an attack is approaching so we'll get a a couple weeks in advance we had a couple scares where we thought we were going to be invaded. And we always had a big heads up. We know the type of equipment the enemy is going to be using and the arsenal they're going to bring. So beforehand, before that initial invasion, we've been rehearsing and training repeatedly every single day on our roles in the defense of our tunnel system. Because the tunnel system can be wiped out with one bunker buster, we have to work in small teams of four men. Why? Because we don't want to have 12 guys die from one bunker buster. It's better to have four. So among those men, we have to fit more than four roles. We have a team leader, medic, heavy machine gunner, reconnaissance slash sniper, PKM gunner, RPG gunner, explosives detonator. Uh, so yeah, if you've been counting, we don't have enough men for all those jobs. So we're gonna have to double up sometimes or even quadruple up. When I was the team leader, I was also the medic, the Dushka gunner and the explosive detonator. But before you yell at me, I made sure to cross train everybody. Everybody knew everybody's job and what they're supposed to do if I were to go down. Now that we have all the tasks set up, we have to have protocol. During an initial invasion, a pre-bombardment is certain. We always got bombarded. I, I remember, I think it was two weeks before I left Shengal, huge bombardment. We thought maybe an invasion was gonna happen. And it didn't, but it's going to happen. That invasion will happen. For the last year, they're flying drones above us all the time, tracking our movement, tracking where we're digging. They're gonna bomb everything. So picture this, we're in our tunnel system, we hear some bombs, which would happen frequently. Situation is gonna dictate, but most of the time we would stay inside the most uh, protected space of our tunnel system for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, if there's no other strikes, we're gonna move out to our tunnel system and conduct sills, which is stop, look, listen, smell. And we're using all of our senses to find out, is there anything above us? Am I able to go outside? And a matter of fact, our tunnel system with four dudes inside it had a JDAM from an F-16 go right on top of it. I think because there's radio signal emitting from that area, nobody was injured. So uh, these tunnel systems are, they're robust. And when I was mentioning rehearsing earlier, part of that is having the reconnaissance go outside or check a tunnel system, figure out where the contact is coming from, where are they invading from? And then from there, we can choose south, east, west, or north. Based on which direction that is, we all have a certain bunker that we're going to be going to to orient our weapon system. So we rehearse this all the time to make sure that we all know where to go. So once the reconnaissance goes outside with his thermal suit and he figures out where the contact is coming from, myself as a team leader is going to direct decisive action on which direction we're going to be orienting. And I know for myself, I had four different tasks but most of them can be done in a connecting file in the intersection between a lot of these bunkers so I can figure out what's going on for my team and staying inside where I'm a little bit more safer and I can conduct a medical evacuation if I need to. And then if I hear an armored threat, I can just run to the Dushka position and get to work. So I'm getting ahead of myself, going a little too specific, but just know that we have protocol for when to move back into cover if we hear something and uh, we're not always just staying in our bunker waiting to die. Our number one mission isn't to take every ISIS or jihadist fighter out. It's to stay alive. That's our number one goal. Which brings us into the post-invasion. So long as we survive, we will continue to work through the tunnel network, no matter which ones have fallen into enemy hands, and continue to peek out the thousands of invisible murder holes that lie in the mountainside. If a tunnel base is about to fall, we're going to blow up the entrances, making sure that nobody can get inside, and we're gonna evacuate. Evacuate to other systems, all of them with clean drinking water, ammunition, radios, anything we would need. Movement is our top priority, and I've spoken about this in the past videos, and tunnels provide that. They provide absolute cover and concealment, which is especially important because we're not wearing body armor like a land war like Ukraine, where I'm in right now. We prioritize movement, able to get around as fast as possible, and our armor 
is the mountain. So remember that this invasion isn't a weak operation. It is an attempted prolonged occupation of a much more sophisticated and larger enemy force. We can't beat them by sheer fire superiority, but by making them wish that they never came. So at this point, you become a mosquito and your land becomes the swamp. They have went into the swamp and you gotta go and kick them out. You gotta go and just keep biting at them. Think about it, if they wear bug spray, after a couple hours it wears off. If you sweat, it doesn't really work too well. Uh, so you put on a, a mosquito net. But after a while, some sticks puncture it and mosquitoes can get in, they're gonna bite you. And if you were to kill one or two mosquitoes, yeah, you'll be okay for a couple minutes but there's always gonna be some more coming in. You're never safe. You will always have raids and ambushes and everything planned up against you for as long as you stay in this occupied land. Time doesn't exist for you. You are a fighter to the bitter end, strictly adhering to a principle of life that without their rules governing over their land, they will not submit. For YBS, this means no sex, no alcohol, no shisha, no cell phone. You can't have any of these things until your land is deoccupied and you have your rules of law, which is democracy. Democratic values, women's rights, YBS, YPG, I'll fight for that. And for the Kurds who've been there for 10 plus years, they will too. The Taliban in Afghanistan won by this mindset. The Viet Cong, even the Japanese soldiers of certain islands, I think in the Philippines, who didn't submit until 30 years later. After 30 years of conducting guerrilla warfare, they were the last one alive. They never gave up. All right, and I know that should be a, a sad story, but it's kind of a story of courage. It's a story of the gorilla mindset. As a mosquito, you're gonna lose a lot of your friends. You will be occupied and life will be a lot harder to live. So again, who wants to live in this swamp? You make life absolute hell for the occupiers and they're gonna go eventually. They, they might stay there for 20 years, but you'll win if you, if you just keep at it. You slowly harass them into leaving. The last point I wanna make, which goes for the initial invasion as well as the post invasion, is winning hearts and minds. As a guerrilla fighter in Iraq, we would feed the populace all the time. We would clean up their wells, uh, take trash out of their streams, fix their electricity. Anytime they needed diesel, hey, here you go. We give them absolutely everything to the point where every single one of them wanted to go and join us as a fighter if an invasion were to happen, or at the very least, give us some information, provide us logistics when we are occupied. As Ryan McBeth, one of my favorite YouTubers, recently mentioned about the Israeli invasion of Gaza, the Israelis did the initial and prolonged fight very well but they forgot about winning over the populace. They forgot to not destroy the remaining buildings for, you know, selfies. They forgot to feed and welcome the populace with dignity. At least that's what it looks like from the outside perspective. And I don't have any skin in this game. I, I actually don't understand that part of the world at all. I'm not even gonna pretend to take a side, but the point remains the same. If you befriend the populace, they're gonna defend you and you will not be exterminated. 20 years down the road, 30 years, you will win. Viet Cong won, Taliban won, uh, the Japanese guy. I mean, he technically won. He outlasted everybody after World War II. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to survive and that's pretty much that, guys. That's how we would have reacted to an invasion. Uh, there's two different stages and we were always just very worried about that initial invasion, really getting ready to give them a big smack on the face whenever uh, they were to come. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about jihadist forces. Uh, backed by Turkey. So these guys came into the YPG held territory in Rojava and Syria, and they took over all this land. And they were in armored vehicles, tanks. They were in all this stuff. They had howitzers. It's a very real fear. And, you know, I think a lot of people forgot just how much equipment ISIS got. Well, there is another ISIS here, and uh, their name is Free Syrian Army. So anyway, thanks for all the support uh, to the members, to the donors, to all the viewers. I really appreciate you guys. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one. I'm going to finish up paperwork here in Kiev and like, a couple days and then I'll probably be able to get to my unit. But uh, until then, videos. I'll see you guys later. Peace.